the first thing I would always say to my students is, whatever your faith tradition, own your text. You are now listening to the Highlight Real Builder for Authors, the Going North Podcast. I'm your host, certified self-leadership trainer and author of the best-selling book, Stay the Course, Dom Brightman. And you're going to be getting some goodies today from the guest that's up next. And today on the High Live Real Builder for Authors, known as the Going North Podcast, I got to thank my super special awesome buddy, Kim O'Neill, all the way from the state of sunny California. Some call it SoCal, and some folks are like, man, so many calories, but hey, that's not the point, because we got one heck of a super special awesome human for you today, my friends. My goodness, this wonderful guest today, this wonderful guest today, like, I have to say, probably about a living legend almost, because his wonderful life on this planet earth started back in the year of 1951 in queens new york and he is an ordained magid and that is a jewish sacred storyteller who is now currently living in san francisco california my man's penned many books many many books and he grew into being a magid through many moments and teachers and heck even according to one of his bios as a five-year-old he lay under enormous honeysuckle view vine with his best friend and sprawled on the ground on that warm day with sun streaming and long shafts of light and as he got into adulthood he was spiritually formed through many communities including gay spirit visions conference in north carolina and the new york healing circle which flourished during the early aids years and he has quite a few mentors ranging from charles lawrence donna donna cunningham Harry Hay, Raven Wolf Dancer, and Rabbi Benet Lappy. So let's give it up for the super special awesome Mr. A.E.R., my man, Andrew Elias Raymer. How you doing today, Andrew? I am doing very well. So thank you for the amazing intro. It's a delight to be here with you. And thank you for acknowledging several of my teachers because we all live in lineages. So even though I may be the one person here with you now, there's a big collective interwoven all the way back through human history of what brings the two of us together. So we're never just alone. Uh, you can say that again. It's so true. Like we, we're all, especially when we get a lot of victories, we got to acknowledge that we're standing on the shoulders of giants, those who came before us and shared the lessons for so that we wouldn't have to learn as long. (laughs) Yes, I quite agree. And there are a lot of lessons. And we're at such a pivotal time. The UN recently released a statistic that they estimate that by the year 2050, which is not that long from now, one billion people on this planet will be refugees because of climate change. Mm. One billion. So we're living in a way in the end of an era and the beginning of another. And the work that you're doing and the people that you invite to be in conversations are such crucial teachers. So thank you for what you do. Oh, my pleasure indeed, my pleasure indeed. Definitely love giving voices to folks from many diverse backgrounds and let them share their life stories, their expertise, and heck, even inspirational messages or some folks need to be aware about because especially that announcement of the UN and 1 billion people being refugees because of climate change because yeah it's 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 rough out here on planet earth we haven't been too kind to it no that is definitely the truth and I think we're running out of time Mm -hmm. I think we have crossed over from the point where we could have averted major climate change to hopefully not coming to the point where we're facing extinction but we don't know that yet yes indeed yes indeed that's right so each and every day we gotta try to do our part try to be a little nicer to mother earth that's right yes well that's that's an interesting segue for me because some of what i teach is that deeply encoded in human consciousness is a reversal of the binaries that we think of 
So what I have been taught by my teachers is that for hundreds of thousands of years, actually human beings thought of the earth as father. Ah. And if we look at some of the images from ancient Egypt, the earth is painted as a man and the heavens arched over his body or the sky or the creator is mother. And so one of the things that I was taught is that when we started as patriarchy evolved to flip this binary consciousness in our brains from thinking of the earth as father and God as mother to making God father and the earth mother, we lost some of our binary primate concepts. So when the earth was male, we lived on a planet that did things that are in binary thinking, gender binary thinking, very limited. So the earth said, no, you cannot dam up that river. No, you cannot build a house there. No, you cannot chop down those trees. There are limits on this planet, kids. Whereas God was our infinitely, endlessly loving, compassionate mother in whose womb all of us were carried. And when we flipped these binaries, we ended up with an earth, a mother earth that was in binary consciousness, exploitable, rapeable, abusable. And we ended up with a God who used to be loving, but became rather judgmental. And so some of my work is to get people to drop back into what's hardwired in our brains, father earth, mother sky. So this may not make sense to everybody, but I invite people to play with it. What is it like to take your idea of God and always make it she? Not that God is he or she, but that what's hardwired in us is actually she, God, comma, she, capital S. So take a deep breath and think, hmm, I hadn't gone there yet, but what will that do to me? And then as we think about 30 years from now, 1 billion refugees on a planet that we have really abused, what if we think that the planet is saying, stop making plastic, stop buying so many things, never drive in your car alone ever again. Anytime you ever want to go someplace, your car should be filled up with your family, your friends, your neighbors. If you can use public transportation, do it. If you can walk, do it and plant billions of trees because I gave you a forest planet and you've decimated it. So that's some of where I come from. Yeah, definitely a great place to come from because I'm pretty sure like even before you became ordained as a magid, like you've been blessed to hear and learn and remember so many countless stories and heck even create hundreds of your own. Yes. Recently, one of the blessings for me of COVID was the not going out for months and months and months very much i added up all the words of my own published books and i don't remember the exact word count but it was one million nine hundred thousand i think 727 words of things i've that have come through me and that i've written that weren't published and so some of that in hebrew the word magid different people pronounce it different ways i tend to say it magid comes from a root that means to explain the huggy to explain, to tell. And so I feel like that's always been my job since I was a little boy. And it's the job of other people. So if you're out there and you're a storyteller, you're in a lineage. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Heck, that even kind of goes back to the beginning of just acknowledging those in our lineage so heck speaking of acknowledging those in our lineage i'm pretty sure there's some other stuff i may have forgotten about your wonderful past that led you up to where you are today so did you ever always see yourself as being a author of multiple published books and still writing and polishing your published work no up until third grade i never wrote a thing it never occurred to me all I did was draw and paint. And I thought that's what I would grow up to be was a visual artist. And then in third grade, my teacher, who I continually thanked, Jeanette Winetsky, stood in front of our classroom 
and recited to us Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Bells, which starts out, I'm going to have to add a little bit like, hear the tinkling bells, delicate bells, what a world of loveliness their harmony foretells. And then it ends with this thunderous, hear the loud alarm bells, brazen bells. Now I sat in my desk and I heard a lot of stories and I'd heard a lot of music and I'd been in a lot of places. My father used to tell his friends all the jazz greats who I had heard playing in smoky supper clubs and jazz clubs in Greenwich Village in my stroller as a little boy. I heard incredible stuff, but that poem touched me, changed my life. I went home, wrote my first poem, and I've been writing ever since. Oh, shoot. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like so who is one of your great teachers, Dom? What got you to be sitting where you are right now? Who is one of your mentors? Oh, man. Uh, definitely the easy answer is uh, John Maxwell. Definitely one of them because his writings changed my life because he actually was a Christian pastor for a couple decades until around I'd say around the late 90s that after pastoring his last church I believe somewhere out in California if I'm not mistaken he actually decided to jump from the Christian perspective and go into the business world and teach leadership because that was the one word that he focused on for so many years and he actually got a lot of flack for that and because uh, that's the thing about religion it's like oh it's all well and good when you stay in the metaphorical box but when you venture out and <laughs> you know they'll be like hey what you doing this is blasphemous here and now if you mention his name in a lot of christian places they'll be like oh man john maxwell he's freaking great i, I love his books they <laughs> they help they help me better lead with my organization so yeah he's definitely one of probably my biggest mentors in life for just leadership and heck even just better living and enjoying personal growth and development Great. Thank you for sharing that. So if you listeners don't know who Dom is talking about, that's your homework. <laughs> Go and look them up and see what can you learn? Because there are so many amazing teachers and a different teacher will speak to a different person. So if you haven't found your teacher yet, Dom may have just opened the doorway. Oh, yeah. That's right, a magical doorway indeed. That's right indeed. In fact, that's probably something that a lot of folks do, especially if they're trying to inform others. They open doors to new gateways of information, new ideas, new inspiration, things they may not consider. Yeah, I think that that's so deeply important, especially in this pivotal time. So I, this used to be my elevator pitch as, as a teacher for a time in my life. When I met people, they said, what do you do? I would say, I teach in the Jewish studies program in the Catholic University, where my best students are always Muslim. <laughs> and some of my Muslim students had never consciously met a Jew before. And their courage in sometimes showing up based on what their family structures were and what they were taught to just show up and say, I need to know what this is, was amazing. That wasn't the case with all of them, but with some. And so their devotion and their dedication in this multi-layered sort of Jewish, Catholic, Muslim reality was to me quite, quite, quite amazing. And the first thing I would always say to my students is, whatever your faith tradition, own your text. Mm. Because even if you can read it in the original Arabic, Sanskrit, Pali, Hebrew, Greek. It was edited yep. before it was ever written down. And before it was ever even edited or written down, it was passed down by word of mouth. And so I often would remind my students about, I don't know if you ever played this when you were little, the game telephone in the classroom oh, when you were little. Yeah. Like I would say to you, um, you know, angels have purple wings. And by the time it came to the very last student, they would be saying, um, there are all sorts of orange things. And so scripture is like that. 
So what I always say to my students is whatever your faith, if you're reading the Bible, the core texts of what's you know called Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, the New Testament or Hebrew and Greek, Jesus did not speak Greek. Everything you're reading, if you know Greek, was translated from Aramaic into Greek and now into English. So what I always say to my students is, if you're reading Bible, if you're reading scripture, if you're reading anything, sit down with at least four different translations if you don't know the core language and let that open you up so that you can own the text. Because what we're often told the text says is a translation of a translation, of a translation, of a translation, of something that was written down 400 years after the Buddha died. So I say that, and then the other thing I say is that that which I call goddess is speaking to us all the time. Maybe not in words, sometimes in sensation, feeling, smell, tone, taste, tingling, so revelation always goes on, doesn't stop. And so it's possible that one of your listeners, Dom, is going to be the next really great transformative faith, faith teacher on this planet. So you're making this possibility happen by what you do. And you know, one of the other things I always love to say to slightly annoy and shake up my students is when the Messiah comes or when Jesus comes back, she will have a lot to say to us. I bet you love the facial reactions when you tell them that, don't you? <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting. Sometimes I follow it up by saying, listen, if you know anything about the American Shakers, they believe the, their primary teacher, Mother Ann Lee, was the second coming of Jesus. And most people don't know that, but if you're curious about how other faith traditions look at reality, the Shakers believed in a kind of not a trinity, but a binary mother, father, God. And they believe that the father energy incarnated on this planet as Jesus Christ and that the mother energy incarnated as Mother Ann Lee, who died in North America, although was born in uh, England in the 1700s. And the Shakers are one of the largest communal faiths in this country. So more homework. If you don't know about it, look up the Shakers, listeners, and listen to some of their music, which is utterly gorgeous. Uh, another reason why I have different guests from diverse backgrounds because there's so many things that we can learn from so many different perspectives, especially nowadays where we have access to so much information. And I love what you said there about whatever faith you believe in, own your text. Because like I remember back in 2012, I started reading the Bible from cover to cover on my own as opposed to relying on just Sunday school and everything else and some of the things in there just blew my mind I'm like wow like this book is actually darker than people actually really put out there because it's just some of the stuff that they were doing with the child sacrifices the wars the battles and all the stuff that, that was going on in there and it's just it it's so true you're so right you definitely have to own your text neck even that led to one of the questions I noted for this conversation is that you actually wrote your own Genesis chapter zero I did. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, I don't want to rewrite the book. Some of my early training was as an archaeologist, and I would never want to change an artifact. But that doesn't mean that how you frame it can't be changed in some way. So if I can dig it up, you want to hear it? Sure. It only goes on for six years and seven months. Yep, I hope I have enough memory. It's about half of a page. <laughs> yeah? It's not very long, Dom. <laughs> Shall I go for it? Up to you. If not, it's in a book called Torah Told Different, and anyone can look it up. So Genesis chapter 0, verse 1. Before God began to create anything, 
before there was heaven or earth, night or day, good or bad, in or out, up or down, God said, I must create myself. Chapter 0, verse 2, and in the vast limitless nothingness of its allness with no borders or boundaries, no direction and no distinctions in its infinite eternal self, God said, let there be me. Chapter zero, verse three. Then God stirred and stretched and shrank and strived and sighed and surged until she became who he is. And her isness is who he always was and always will be in the midst of her sacred unfolding. And God called himself whole and saw that everything that was possible came from her radiant wholeness. And there was someone, and there was some when. And from that some when, God was finally ready to begin to create a somewhere. Man, oh man. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Definitely an interesting chapter today because that's the thing. Like with the traditional Bible, it's like we never get the backstory. It's like, hey, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's like he had to create himself first. <laughs> Let there be me. <laughs> yeah. It's meant to be somewhat comic, and it's meant to play with some of the verses which you just got in the very beginning of Genesis chapter 1. Let there be light. Oh, yeah. And some of the text that does say uh, that God creates the first person in its image, male and female. So what is that telling us? Was the first person actually androgynous? And is God, therefore, in some way androgynous? That's how I read the text. I don't know how you read it. I don't know how other people read it. But that's how I read it. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Peck even goes back to what she even mentioned earlier, the four different translations, like... And heck, even the classic game of telephone is a great, really, analogy for what a lot of text that we have today. It's like, hey, don't want to mess with an artifact, but sometimes, especially the English language, there are so many incomplete phrases from English being such a young language compared to a lot of the other languages out there that don't have the proper word or phrase to describe things as directly as some other languages. No, it's true. Um... There's scientific research, actually, that children who were taught to sign rather than to speak actually become fluent around six months sooner than children wow. who were taught to speak. So there's some evidence that the very first languages that human beings spoke may have been signed. Mm. And that what's hardwired in our brain, in addition to Father Earth and Mother Sky, is that speech is with our hands and not with our mouths. And so what does a sacred text look like, feel like, when it's entirely communicated by sign, by gesture, and not by word? That may have been our most ancient original sacred text. And I've sometimes wondered, did people invent and start to use fire? Because when there is no light and you're sitting with someone who is signing, you can't see them. And did somebody one day think, that's a great story and now it's dark. If we could do something to make light happen, then you could finish that story. Because in the dark, you can keep telling a story and your listeners, unless they can't hear, can hear. But when it's dark and you're signing, you can't see the story. So that's my theory about why we invented fire. Not to stay warm, not to cook, but so that we could finish stories. And that might be part of your lineage because you're a storyteller yourself and you keep inviting storytellers to hang out with you. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. And that's an interesting perspective that 
personally, I've heard for the first time ever. It's like, oh yeah, fire. We invented fire. We have fire. So that way I can actually finish the story. Because <laughs> you can't see it in the dark. That makes so much perfect sense. And and when you and as you were going through the explanation of sign language being the first one, the heck even with babies actually being able to be more fluent six months quicker as opposed to learning words first, that makes a lot more sense, especially when I think of those classic cartoons with the cavemen just making noises and then being expressive with their hands because like movement especially in our youth that's what we love to do like even like even with the walking or attempting to crawl like we just love to move and if you're able to move in a certain way and that same movement is understood between both parties for the sign language then that that does make sense i can see how that makes sense Mm -hmm. certainly does to me so with all of this learning that you're doing, my goodness, is <laughs> so I'm guessing English and then I guess Hebrew. Are there any other languages you've picked up with all the wonderful studies that you've had across your wonderful life? I used to be rather fluent in French, and that's dropped away. Although if I watch a French movie after about 20 minutes, half an hour, unless it's very modern and very colloquial, I can pretty much understand it. But I was too lazy a student to really do the homework that I should have done. So I regret that. (laughs) Hey, it's all good. Probably too busy learning stories and writing your own. (laughs) And having amazing experiences. You know, as you said, I had my first spiritual experience at five, lying under honeysuckle blossoms with... uh, my friend Janie, who is still in my life, 65 years later. So I I have a sense, and I'm saying this to anyone who's listening who is a parent, I have a very deep sense that all of us from birth have spiritual experiences, but that we're living in a culture that doesn't nourish and cultivate those. And I think in this transitional time, babies are coming in with profound knowledge, really ancient souls are coming back to be reborn, to help us make this transition. So so here's a personal example. When I was around three, I remembered many past lives. In great detail, I remembered my last life. And once I asked my mother, Mommy, what happened to my other parents? Now, I live with my mommy, my baby brother, and my parents in a three-room apartment, and my parents slept in on their bed in the living room. We were not rich. I had incredibly vivid memories of an enormous house and servants and a summer house and things that I had never seen in this life yet at that point. So when I said, mommy, and I remembered my other parents really quite vividly. And when I asked her that question, mommy, what happened to my other parents? Mommy was a bit upset. (laughs) Well, there's a wonderful book that I read years ago that I think is called Children's Past Lives. And what the author did, and I may be conflating different books on reincarnation, but one of the things the author did was interview people from cultures that do believe in reincarnation. So if I have been born Druze, if I have been born Hindu, if I have been born in a different culture, when I said, Mommy, what happened to my other parents? Mommy would have said, tell me about them. What did they look like? Where did you live? Maybe I knew you then too, but that was not a part of my mommy's reality. And she got very upset. Like, oh my God, the kid is three and he's crazy already. So, (laughs) if you're listening and you're a parent, pay attention to what your children are bringing you that actually may be wiser than you are because they haven't forgotten. There's a story, I don't know if you've ever heard this time, that I love. A child is sitting on the floor with like paper and crayon, drawing like crazy. And the parent comes in and says, sweetheart, what are you drawing? And the child looks up and says, I'm drawing a picture of God. You know the story? And 
the parent says, no one knows what God looks like. And the child says, well, wait till I finish my drawing. So this may be your child. And they may actually be wiser than you are right now, than we are right now. And so cultivating um, a, not just a mindset, but a heart set. I'm thinking about what James Redfield said in your interview with him about the importance of coming from the heart. If we can cultivate a heart set that when one of your kids says, mommy, daddy, parent, what happened to my other parents? You sit down and you say, tell me about them. There's another story that I like that parents are sitting in the kitchen and they have one of those little monitors in the baby's room. And they're sitting at the kitchen table and they hear their older child go into the little child's bedroom and the older child kind of leans over the crib and says, quick, tell me about God and heaven because I'm starting to forget. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> definitely definitely powerful definitely interesting heck even reminds me of I, I forgot who it was that that said in the past that sometimes children they may say they have imaginary friends that may be one of their spirit guides or heck even one of the wonderful spirits that's like a guardian angel that's protecting them like that imaginary friend may not be so imaginary they they just may be a spirit Oh, totally. I, I think what's interesting is I heard voices as far back as age three. I have a photograph of my great, great, great grandfather that I'm looking at right now, who I have felt his presence with me my entire life. Now, according to the family legend, he was born in the 1700s, lived through the 1800s, died in the early 1900s. And he never seemed imaginary. He always seemed and still feels present in a way. And I wasn't looking to encounter angels, but one of the books that I've co-authored is called Ask Your Angels. And it's a step-by-step -step guide for people to make conscious contact with their guardian angel, or as they sometimes like to be called, companion angel. Ooh, well, that's no one companion angel. There we go. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what, they, what they said to me years ago, they may say something different, but they haven't, is when you hear the word guardian angel, you immediately think there's something I need to be guarded from, and that triggers your kind of fight and flight response. But when you hear companion angel, you settle into a different place. Guardian angel, whew, companion angel, ah. Ah, there we go, there we go, yes indeed. Some new thought for the average human who may not think about it, because that's so darn true. Like, guard, it's like, oh man, I gotta be guarded against something. Oh man, thank you for giving me out that car accident. But hey, it could be just a companion angel that gives you some heck, even some divine guidance of avoiding certain places, people, heck, maybe even certain things. Yeah, so it, it, heck, even maybe just have wonderful good advice. So, companion angel, definitely love it. My goodness, my goodness. So, with all of these wonderful stories and all these wonderful ideas, my goodness, do you believe that your connection to spirit is one of the major factors that contributes to creativity, or maybe something, something totally different? I think it's the only thing that contributes to my creativity, possibly that I had creative ancestors and that some of the DNA of the object that this soul inhabits was pre-programmed that way. But I've sometimes said I was poorly socialized as a child and that some of the skills that I should have been taught out of, like listening to voices and remembering things, I just didn't get that training severely enough, in spite of my mother giving me quite a look when I, a quite a negative look when I said, mommy, what happened to my other parents? <laughs> and so I think spirit has continued to flow through me. And my hope in this time is really the fulfillment of a line in the Hebrew Bible, 
where Moses says, would that all of God's people were prophets. And my hope is that that's the period that we're entering into, that everyone will start to own their prophecy, their capacity to be a prophet, whatever that word means. I think in the fall of 2018, I was sitting on the living room floor about six feet from where I'm sitting now. And I had this vision of an enormous jigsaw puzzle. It had no picture. It looked kind of like a marble countertop. It was perpendicular to the floor. I was looking at it. Billions of pieces in this jigsaw puzzle. And then from behind, one little piece was pushed out. And a voice, angelic, behind the puzzle said, there is one piece in this puzzle for every person alive now. Everyone alive now has a share in the transformation of human life upon this planet. And the little piece that was pushed out, what I was told was, this is what your contribution is. And I knew exactly what it was. Pieces of things I've been teaching and receiving since the 70s and 80s up until the present. And so my invitation when I tell the story to students and in workshops is, you have a piece also. You have a piece, you have a piece. Who's ever listening to this, you have a piece. Now I'm telling you some of what my piece is. We know that our host is fulfilling a big piece of his piece of the puzzle simply by holding the space. That may not be all that's on your little piece, Tom, but you're doing a good job of fulfilling what's your part of the jigsaw puzzle. So this is my invitation to everyone and sit quietly. Feel your breath, feel your body, feel your feet on the floor or beneath you if you're sitting cross-legged. Settle into your pelvis, come out of your head, just drop into your body. And ask yourself, everyone alive now has a share in the transformation of human life upon this planet. What's mine? What is mine? Man, oh man, my goodness. I hope folks are getting the necklace full of jewels out of this one, because I sure am indeed. My goodness, that's right. Oh, man. Yes, indeed. We are all pieces of this giant jigsaw puzzle. And we got to find out which piece we are on the puzzle. That's right. Definitely got to give that wonderful contribution to the wonderful planet. Heck, even, even beyond, too. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. My goodness. So, since this is far from your first rodeo, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often? Oh. <laughs> Good question. Uh, ask me what I think the most important thing anyone can ask themselves would be after what is my share. Or maybe they're interwoven because it's a jigsaw puzzle. So pieces, questions, people fit together. To me, the most important question is possibly not an expected one, but the question is, how did you die in your last linear incarnation? Now, you may not believe in reincarnation, and so this could be a mind game, but the question, and I've been asking this for a very long time because this is what I was guided to ask people, is really useful even if you think it's kind of a mind fantasy to say, oh, in my last life, I was bop, living beep, bop, 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 in this part of the world. I was that, I was this, I was old, I was young, I was here, I was there. Because how we died in our last life and what we brought back with us shapes and colors all of the dramas of our childhood, whether we're raised by a birth parent or parents, whether we're adopted foundlings, in blended families. It shapes our experience of all the pieces of our reality 
in a way, the standard classical psychotherapy will probably not get us to, because your therapist, if you've ever been in therapy or analyst, is probably not going to stay. So, um, Sonia, we've been working on your family of upbringing for the last 35 years, and you're still a mess. Is it possible that you're a mess because of what you brought in from your last life? So I find it a useful question. I find it a useful question because I remember in very great detail, I'm dying in my last life as a six-year-old boy in a Nazi gas chamber. And I am now 70. It shapes every moment of my life. The other day, there was an article in the New York Times on their website about some people who identified little tiny film clips of families and children being carted off by the Nazis and even talking about it. I'm on the verge of tears. How many of us have in our lineage, direct physical lineage trauma, 100% of us? And how many of us brought in, since millions and millions of people died in the 20th century, First World War, Second World War, all kinds of atrocities, um, holocausts all over the planet, genocide all over the planet. How many of us brought that back? And we were born into a lovely suburban house in a gorgeous suburb on a hill, and everything was perfect, but we were lying in our crib having brought terror with us. So to me, this is a really useful question that most people don't think about and that we're seldom asked that explains a lot of if you had a really happy childhood and you're not happy. If you had a really awful childhood and memory magnified that. You know, my family was poor when we were little, but I remembered living in an attic with almost no food. And I could never eat enough. No matter what my mother put in front of me, I devoured it because that other little boy was living in an attic eating rotten food. And to this day, if I open my refrigerator and I forgot the lettuce in the back and it started to rot, I can barely touch it. I have horror of rotten food from a little boy who died at age six in a gas chamber in Nazi Germany. So what do we bring with us is useful to look at in this time of transformation. Uh, so thank you for indeed, asking me that question. Powerful one too, because it's one that folks made well, then again, I don't think any, any guest has actually uh, dropped that one. But it actually did remind me of a conversation with a recent guest, um, I believe, uh, I think it was that, Dr. Allison J.K., where I believe she was talking about some karma from my past life, how it's sometimes hard to clear that, and it just reminded me of that, and it's really sad how that happened to you, that whole ordeal of that Holocaust, which should have never happened. It's, it's actually a shame that that happened and that there's still nonsense going around today where folks are, that there's basically almost genocide across the globe in certain parts of it that shouldn't be happening. And really just being able to, at a point now where you are, to be able to share stories and help people think on a deeper level and just, heck, even think. Cause sometimes folks may not even think. <laughs> so... Definitely, thank you for sharing that. Definitely, thank you for sharing that. So, coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive, and that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you were 25 again, but this time in the current year of 2021, with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Marvelous question. That was a very pivotal age for me. Um, so that's when my spiritual life opened. So if I was to start all over again, back in that pivotal place by now, I would say, darling, trust what's happening more. Don't question it so much. 
see what happens. Give yourself five years to see where this goes. Instead of thinking, as often happened to me, somewhat comically, often when I had a spiritual experience and it was over, I would think, oh my God, that was an acid flashback. <laughs> and then I would remember that I've never taken acid. But I did that a lot. I asked that question over and over. And I remember the exact moment in, in my freshman dorm when a boy down the hall who I had a giant crush on and who was sort of my drug guide scored two tabs of acid and offered me one in a very clear voice in my head said, do not do this until your 40th birthday. So I handed it back to him and I said, I'm not supposed to do this till my 40th birthday. And when it came to my 40th birthday, I spent a lot of time in therapy discussing whether I was supposed to and ended up not doing it anyway. So I would say trust more. I would want to trust more. And that's a word I almost never use. But several weeks ago, I was in a meditation class and we were invited to travel on a light beam five years into the future and interview ourselves and ask for a word that would be transformative. I thought I would get love or mindfulness or compassion or grace, and I got trust. Not a word I had. Maybe when you die in a gas chamber, you don't come back very trusting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Glad you avoided the acid, too. Definitely glad you avoided that. <laughs> Some people had amazing experiences on it, but I'm wired differently. So I'm grateful for the voice that said, no, nah, don't do this. Yeah, probably figure by the time you're 40, you wouldn't really do it anyway. <laughs> You'd probably be a little bit more wiser in the, I guess, in the worldly sense that you'll be like, oh, no, nah, I don't think this will be good. Let me get some therapy. <laughs> yeah, I was wired differently. But it's a really lovely question because I'm just thinking back to who I was and where I was. And that really is when my life opens. So I don't know whether that's true for everybody, but that was so transformational for me. That was when I opened to spirit at that very age. Yep. Yep. 25 is definitely a interesting, powerful year for a lot of folks. Uh, a lot of guests indeed. Usually they're like, Oh yeah. Was it for you? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the special year for me. Funny enough. That's the, Reason beyond the question, I actually, that was actually the year my father passed away from dementia, and oh. I gained a bunch of weight, and I was volunteering so much for a volunteer organization, and launching a book, and all this other stuff that I was basically running and leading on empty, so, yeah, it was a, it was a powerful year, yeah, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely, uh, got some, uh, lessons out of that one, but my dad, he lived a long life, he passed away at 92, and Ooh. he, he lived a long, full life, and definitely grateful for him. He, um, a little bit on the hard-headed side of the game, <laughs> so I got some of that in me, too, and loved to do some hard work. He was still lifting heavy boxes in his early 80s as a volunteer mm. for the church, since, uh, my church, heck, even probably now more than ever, there's not a lot of youth left, and especially in the middle of the day where folks are, kids are in school, it's like, oh, well, uh, kind of need some extra help here, some extra muscles, like, oh, we just... He would, <laughs> there would be some choice words coming out of his mouth later. <laughs> and he'd be really tired, but he'd still enjoy it. <laughs> he'd definitely enjoy it, so yeah. What was his name? Oh, name was David. Yep, name's David. Well, hey, David, thank you for all the ways in which you shaped and molded this amazing being who's holding this incredible transformative space which might not have been what you consciously imagined he would do with your legacy but oh is it good work oh yeah thanks a bunch indeed thanks a bunch indeed well speaking of good work you got so much of it out there and heck even the beautiful thing about it is heck we didn't even dive into the name part because i'll put a link to the Show notes to the wonderful episode of Kim where you dive deeper into that because um I believe Elias was your grandfather's name and you got some books under Andrew Raymer, some uh, Andrew Elias Raymer, so definitely uh want to point people in that direction. So what's the best way for folks to reach out and learn more about you and heck even possibly reach out and do some collaboration with you? 
My website is andrewraymer.com and you're welcome to wander there. And what Tom just referred to is at age 70, I decided to go by my chosen middle name, which was my great, great grandfather's name. He was an Italian Jew who I never met and don't have a photograph of. I have a photograph of his son, that's as far back as I can go. But the website is andrewraymer.com. And I think increasingly what I feel like is what's important is not the person speaking, but the books and the books are out there. So there's a little page that has all of the books and things online and one could go and explore those. Woohoo! Well, there you have it, folks. Head over to andrewraymer.com. It's going to be in the show notes indeed. Check out his wonderful chat with Kim and buy some copies of his wonderful book. Share with your friends, share with your family, share with your cat, penguin, dog, horse, maybe even a camel if you have a camel. Indeed, so that way they can get something to expand their mind, expand their thinking, something out of the blue. Heck, even get a chuckle or two, too, since uh, <laughs> he has a gift for uh, humorous writing. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So any parting words before we close up shop? In Hebrew and in Greek, the word angel in Hebrew, malach means messenger. All of us are messengers. All of us have a share in the transformation of human life upon the planet as we're facing increasing climate change. So we're this evening in the presence of Angel Dawn. And his father, Dave, where do our lineages go back? Where do your lineages go back? What did you bring with you? That's the set of questions to live with now. So that our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren can breathe. In a way, COVID to me was sort of a test run of climate change in the future when no one will be able to go out ever without a breathing mask, not because of a virus, but because the air is so toxic. And we don't want that. We don't want our kids to have that. So let's do our homework. Listen to all of the people that Dom has interviewed and find what your piece of the puzzle is. And thank you so much for having me. What a wonderful conversation. I'm feeling truly blessed. This is your host, Dom Brightman. Hope you enjoyed what you just heard. And if you really did, do me a solid and leave a review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, wherever you're listening to. And subscribe to hear more because more is coming your way to advance you further than before.